As we approach the PGA Championship, things are increasingly murky in the world of golf. Shannon Sharp and ESPN are nearing a long-term deal. Brad Pitt's F1 movie could be one of the most expensive films ever. And later, we are hearing from the one and only Tom Brady, who recently began his career as an electric boat racing team owner. It's Monday, May 13th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. PGA Championship starts on Thursday. Joining me now to discuss is Front Office Sports newsletter writer David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you back on. Um, so let's start with the clear dominant golfer in today's game, Scotty Scheffler. Um, I, I've talked with our colleague Mike McCarthy a bit about this, but he's he's kind of, you know, he's the guy and golf hasn't had a guy like him maybe in a little bit in terms of someone who is just the clear favorite any any event he plays in. Um would you say this is good for golf to have Scotty Scheffler in that role? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I, I know Mike, uh, after the Masters wrote or asked, does golf have a Scotty Scheffler problem? And, and I totally get where he's coming from. That was a good column. But I'm kind of of the thinking that, hey, maybe if he's dominant enough, Scheffler, then it could actually be a good thing for golf. I mean, if he wins the PGA Championship, which he's the favorite to do, he would be two majors into the season, one, two majors, that's halfway towards the calendar grand slam. That's something that Tiger Woods never even did. And we keep talking about, you know, nobody can be as dominant as Tiger Woods was. And I, we don't think Scheffler will be right. He's not going to get 82 career PGA tour victories. At least I don't think so, but could he win all four majors this year? Probably not. That's kind of a wild assumption, but each time he plays, it doesn't seem like he's going to get beat. And I think that eventually more casual fans would start tuning in if it's like, man, this guy is unbeatable. Yeah. I mean, I feel like having that character in a sport helps bring in casual fans because it makes it makes it more polarized and it, it gives you a clearer feel for it when it's like the Yankees are the best team and like everyone else is trying to beat them or like Lewis Hamilton always wins or now it's Max Verstappen always wins. And uh, it like, it gives you a very easy narrative other it, instead of just like, there's a bunch of people, they're all, they're all trying to win and let's see who wins. Um, you know, obviously if you're more of a golf fan, it's, it's not that, but if you're casual, I mean, it used to be Tiger Woods, it's like Tiger versus everyone. Now the Scotty versus everyone thing can work. It's just like, is Scotty himself, you know, uh, a good like TV presence. And a lot of people would say he's not, but I think, uh, but I think is, I think dominance is a better narrative than people give it credit for. Yeah, definitely. And I think when you had somebody like Rory McIlroy dominating 10 years ago, which he was, he what last won his last major championship on this golf course at Valhalla golf club in Kentucky at the 2014 PGA championship. And he hasn't won one since, but back in those days when he was dominating, you know, he was a huge personality, kind of a fiery young guy, um, really a little bit more animated than somebody like Scotty Scheffler. And uh, maybe that's not a good thing for your golf game, but it sure, you know, built a fan base for Rory that is, you know, still follows him today. Obviously he's kept, uh, kept up winning, not major championships, but plenty of other tournaments, but, you know, or if it's like a, a Ricky Fowler who built up such a big fan base kind of with his outlandish colors and, and big personality, uh, Scotty just doesn't really have any of that. And I don't think he cares to. And let's hop over to someone else who hasn't won much in a while, but still has a big fan base, Tiger Woods. Um, so, yeah, he's in this sort of interesting phase of his career where he's still competing. He's going to be at the PGA Championship, right? Um, but um, but he's not expected to win. But he's also this sort of almost an elder statesman in the golf world in in both his own brand, but also kind of as the golf world is in flux in a whole lot of ways. Uh, he's he's a very important piece of that puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you bring up his branding, right? He left Nike at the end of last year after almost three decades together. And now he's wearing his new Sunday red brand and trying to get that off the ground. Uh, sales just started of that. I'll be interested to see, are people going to follow him or was it more the, the Nike effect like uh, Jordan with Nike and Tiger with Nike? That'll be interesting to see. And then, yeah, to your point, he's he's not a favorite to win this week or, or any other week that he tees it up, but he's he's just a boost being there in general, I mean, at the Masters, ESPN had some great viewership during the first and second rounds just because 
Tiger was there battling to make the cut. They it was the best in almost five years, I think, for them. And then when when we talk about uh, you know Live Golf first PGA Tour, uh, Tiger Woods is right there as well. He's you know helping lead negotiations with the, the PIF for a potential investment there. You know billions of dollars at stake. And uh, you know someone like Roy McIlroy has been kind of in and out of that role too. But you know Tiger Tiger is there, and I think that's that's good for the PGA Tour to have a strong personality like him, even though he's not a full-time member of the PGA Tour anymore as far as his playing schedule, he, he clearly still cares about his well-being. Yeah, I'm mean, speaking from a very far remove here, but Tiger does feel a little more comfortable than Rory McIlroy kind of being in those negotiations, whereas, you know, Rory, you know, was very critical of live golfers and he yeah, has been been kind of on and off the, the PGA board and terms of and um so he, he seems more internally conflicted and also more of a divisive figure just whether or not he's in the room um what do we know at this point about the pga's negotiations with with saudi arabia it feels like there was going to be they announced that they were had agreed to make a deal and then the deal wasn't happening and now it's you know we're looking at around five months after they they were originally supposed to make a deal so where are we at now yeah, so right around the Masters, I wrote a piece for FOS, kind of everything you need to know about the PGA Tour and Live Golf and, you know, any potential merger. They don't like it when you say merger because they say, say they're not merging, even though that's what, what they said at the time, which I'll give them some some credit there, whatever. But yeah, honestly, we're, we don't know really much more than we knew at the Masters or at the Players' Championship or really at the beginning of this year. And things where they stand are as we're just wait, wait, waiting. Right. Is the PIF going to invest in the PGA Tour and their for profit entity, which is called PGA Tour Enterprises, like they got this one point five billion dollar investment from the strategic sports group, which is filled with all these other sports owners like Fenway Sports Group and Arthur Blank of the Falcons, et cetera. Uh, the PIF, we think, has this opportunity to basically come be a minority investor, just like SSG is, and then hopefully that would make it a lot easier to figure out what to do with live golf, what to do with live golf players as far as a schedule. But, you know, I I don't think at this point, I don't think 2025 is going to look any different than 2024 is looking for professional golf. Maybe there would be some change by 2026, but you know, they got to get these schedules out for next year by the end of this summer. And I, I don't think that there's any deal in place that would alter that. And this is a very present issue for live golfers, right? Because, um, as time goes on, they're not accumulating OWGR points. And so for, for tournaments where you have to have a certain number of points to automatically get in, um, there are going to be fewer and fewer of them who, who are, are into that system. Yeah. And you bring up a good point because there's, uh, 16 live golfers, uh, supposed to be in the field at this PGA championship and, uh, seven of them did not qualify and weren't going to be in, but the PGA of America decided to give them special invites or special exemptions um, based on prior performance, or maybe they were close enough in, in the world rankings. They felt like they were good enough. Um, the, the PGA of America prides itself on making the PGA championship one of the strongest fields in golf. They try to get all top 100 players in the world in there, plus uh, anybody else like these live golfers that they think can make for a really good tournament. So you had somebody like uh, Joaquin Neiman, who also got a special invite to the Masters. You know, he was one of the first ones to get one of these. And then the PGA of America decided to invite six more. And yeah, it's it, it's nice, but it's there's no guarantee that they can keep doing this. And it's they can't get into the US Open, for example, by that way. The USGA isn't doing that. They have an open qualifying system that they can go try to qualify with 10,000 other people that want to make it into the U.S. Open if they're good enough and can make it. So it is a really interesting uh, time as far as these live golfers coming over. And yeah, if they can play well at the PGA Championship, they can uh, make it a lot easier on themselves for majors moving forward. Yeah, it's this funny situation where it feels like it matters how they do in the tournament, you know, how, and that that could affect the negotiations. It could affect, yeah, their their future invites if they don't perform very well, and they're you know they're, they fall further and further down the rankings, and it's this kind of awkward judgment call of you're in, you're out. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's more than golf at stake here at the championship. Yeah. And, and so often that's kind of what the criticism of live golf is sometimes, right? That there's not anything 
to be played for besides money. There's no, you don't get into this next tournament like you do. If you win a PGA Tour event and you're not in the Masters already, boom, you're into the Masters. It's a huge deal beyond the $1.5 million you win or whatever. Yeah. And if you're one of these live guys that got in on an exemption and you go, you top five at the PGA, then you're into all the next year's majors and you're into the PGA next year. So it, it, it does mean something, um, especially for these guys that are not prior major champions, like a Brooks Kepka or a John Rahm, who they of course have, you know, exemptions for, you know, lots of majors moving forward. But for some of these other guys, it, it is a big deal. Yeah. David Rumsey, always enlightening. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. ESPN stepped in quickly when Shannon Sharp left Undisputed on FS1, and now the two appear that they'll be paired up for long term. Sharp is nearing a four-year deal with ESPN, according to The Athletic. Sharp helped Stephen A. Smith extend his lead over Skip Bayless, who pushed Sharp out at Undisputed. Smith's short take has averaged 482,000 viewers since Sharp joined in September, up 12% year over year. Meanwhile, it's been the opposite story at Sharp's old media home. Undisputed has seen audiences below 50,000 on some days in March and April. That's not been the case for all of FS1 shows, however. The Herd and First Things First both had record 2023s, averaging 156 and 131,000 viewers, respectively. When Skip and Chen is split, it's possible that FS1 got rid of the wrong guy. Liberty Media, Disney, and the cities of Las Vegas and Miami aren't the only entities betting big on the enduring popularity of Formula One. That list also includes Brad Pitt. The movie star is working on a Formula One movie, and the production cost has reportedly reached $300 million. That would make it one of the most expensive movies ever made. The movie will star Pitt himself as a retired F1 driver who mentors a young driver. The film is produced by Pitt's production company, Jerry Bruckheimer, and F1 legend Lewis Hamilton, who is also in the movie, which is being filmed at actual F1 races. The rights to the film have been purchased by another big spender in sports media, Apple. When it's released, the movie will both be in theaters and on Apple TV+, Plus, and that could blur the lines over whether it's considered a commercial success, because in addition to how much it makes at the box office, there will be the more nebulous question of how many subscriptions it drives to the streaming service. Some of the inflated costs has to do with the film starting production right around the writer's strike, but it also has to do with the ongoing belief backed up by record U.S. viewership numbers in Miami that what started with a viral Netflix show propelling F1 to new heights has turned into something much more. Thrilled to be joined now by Tom Brady and Team Brady, his E1 team, and principals Ben King and Joe Sturdy. Welcome, Tom. Welcome, Ben. Welcome, Joe. What's up, Keith? So to orient our audience a little bit here, uh, E1 is a new electric boat racing series. Brady is the owner of Team Brady. Tom, what drew you to, uh, to this series? What drew me to the series was sports and competition and great teammates with a great work ethic who are determined to succeed. Yeah, it sounds great. But, um, you know, you, you could find competition, you know, with a local lacrosse team or with, uh, you know, your your local uh, your pickleball team. Why, what, why electric boat racing? I love competition. I do it all. So I love football. I love soccer, pickleball, uh, racing. And I love I love speed. I love performance. And I love the sustainability aspect to this racing series. Certainly having something in Venice. We were talking earlier, uh, Venice would never have allowed kind of this race with combustion engines. So to think about what we're doing with sustainability, bring communities together to think about um, the type of awareness that needs to be brought to areas of the world like this, like Miami, where I live, where climate change is affecting us all. To be involved in a sports series that's really forward thinking was super exciting for me. And, uh, and I think we're off to a great start, but it's only gonna get better. We're gonna build more. We've got great team owners that are really invested in the success of the league and their own individual teams. And um, and I want our team to win the championship. All right, very cool. And uh, Ben or Joe, let either of you take this. Uh, just describe the, an E one race to me. What, what would it look? What does it look like? It's visually very striking. Yeah, visually, it's amazing. You have nine race birds on the water, hydrofoiling, flying like planes. Um, we have lots of short, sharp races. It's really exciting action. Um, and yeah, the, the boats are technically very difficult to drive. They're amazing bits of machinery, but um, like ultimately the, the spectacle comes from just having all of these amazing people and amazing technology all in one place. And how would you describe Tom as a team owner? What's his style? <laughs> Careful, boys. 
<laughs> you can be honest uh, here. No one's, you know, no pressure. Yeah, no, Tom, Tom, is, Tom is incredibly supportive. Uh, literally from from the first moment uh, that uh, we were we were confirmed to uh, work as cozy principals for the team, uh, we we knew that we had Tom's support, which uh, was really important, and um, and also just trusting us to you know to do the the right job. We obviously have the experience in. In motorsport, both Joe and I have come from uh, car racing, so it's a little bit different, but there's a lot of overlap as well. And um, Tom was keen to kind of leave us to do, you know, what we know that we can do, but then at the same time, help us to, to guide us, support us, inspire the team, um, and uh, yeah, keep ourselves accountable as well. Tom, as you're, you know, you're in your post-playing career, but you're keeping busy, you know, you've got this, you've got other ownership interests, you've got a broadcasting career around the corner, um, how, you know, with, with the myriad, you know, things you could be doing, how are you, you know, making your choices in terms of where you're putting your, your time and your energy? I think things that seem just exciting to me and that fit with who I am. If there, if, if this racing series has similar values to the ones that I believe in and that I see, uh, that, that, that get me excited. So I think aspects of what I've learned over many years in competitive sports is success in different arenas always comes back to the same values and sports are about people and people are about trust and belief. And, and I think we're trying to find um, this trust and belief in our own team in this racing series to ultimately be champions. And it's not easy to do because you know what, there's a lot of other people who want the same thing as us. So the way we're going to reach the top is to have great communication, which these two are phenomenal communicators. They're great principals. They care very much about what we're doing. I see it. Every email that's written, everything that's exchanged is always about how do we improve? There's great humility. And I think we're bringing um, this forward thinking technologies to the world. We're trying to uh, make a difference in more ways than just a competitive race, trying to bring awareness to sustainability in all the cities that we're racing, racing these, uh, these race birds in. Yeah, very cool. And what's a business that you'd love to run one day, like in future? Uh, well, again, I just, it's really sports focused. That's, that's where I enjoy. I enjoy the business of sports. So uh, lots of competitions, lots of people, leading people, um, seeing people maximize their potential and opportunity, the things that they love to do themselves, uh, whether it be physically, mentally, or emotionally. How do you get the most out of people and teams to actualize your potential and to win in whatever area of life that you're involved in? Tom Brady, Ben King, Joe Sturdy. It's a quick one, but thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Thank you very much. Good luck, pal. Cheers. Thank you. That is it for today. Subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.